Thanks, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Your Honour. Could we please recall Mr. Walkley to the stand? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Walkley. Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, Mr. Walkley, before lunch we were talking about, among other things, the process of excavating the, um, the route which you've described. Um, one thing I uh, meant to ask you in that connection was um, of, this, of yourself, Mr. Bones and Mr. Johnson, uh, would you say that any one of you was in charge of that process of um, uh, doing the excavation? I was overseeing that. You. Thank you. Now, um, immediately before lunch, we were um, discussing the issue of uh, glass and the potential that uh, uh, broken or discarded pieces of glass lying around the property might have had a magnifying effect and caused the ignition of the fire. Do you recall that discussion? I do. When you were conducting your investigation of the fire site, um, did you um, uh, have a look for any signs as to whether there was an indication that glass might have been responsible for the ignition of this fire? Uh, throughout our examination of the area of origin, I did not see any pieces of glass in that area. Thank you. Now, um, <clears throat> can I ask you, Mr. Walkley, about the potential role of cigarette butts or discarded cigarettes in igniting a uh, wildfire of the kind that you concluded had ignited at 242 White Hills Road? Um, firstly, could you explain to His Honour, in your experience, um, what's the likelihood that a discarded cigarette butt thrown into uh, an area like the area of confusion for this fire might have caused the ignition of a wildfire? Uh, the likelihood is very slim. Um, I can elaborate as to why that is, if you like. Yes, please. Yes. Um, first thing is, um, since 2010, it's been legislated in Australia that all cigarettes must self-extinguish if they're not being inhaled on. That, that's a, a law. So it, that's done via the cigarette paper, which acts as an external wick to the cigarette. And along that paper, I've seen it explained in papers as being a um, like a road bump or, or a slow-down hump. That every now and then, if the cigarette doesn't keep being inhaled on, the cigarette will go out. Uh, that's not to say that cigarettes will not cause bushfires. I, I know from experience that they can cause some grass fires. However, they must be in the right situation at the right time and the right uh, confluences all come together at the same time for that to happen. Uh, I have read many papers about cigarettes causing fires and there is quite a few, a lot, which um, refute the fact that they cause as many fires as the public perceives them to do. Um, and I personally thought I would test that theory. <coughs> and when I was doing a training course at Cambridge on one occasion, I got about 20 cigarettes. I placed them all in 20 different containers with different amounts of grass or straw and placed the cigarette while it was burning into those 20 containers. I think it was about 20. Out of the 20 cigarettes that I put in the 20 containers full of straw or grass, not one of them ignited the grass. And the reason for that is the cigarette must fall into the grass and the grass must insulate the cigarette to hold the heating. Now, a cigarette at the burning tip end of it when you're inhaling is around about 700 degrees Celsius. When you're not inhaling, or the smoke is not inhaling the cigarette, then the tip end is about 300 degrees Celsius, which is also, by the way, the ignition temperature of grass is also about the same temperature. Now, the ignition temperature of, of any material is the material at, at the temperature at which that will ignite in the absence of an external flame being introduced. 
So the grass has to be heated to 300 degrees, which is about the same temperature as a cigarette when it's not being inhaled on. And it's got to be in contact with the cigarette for long enough for it to heat up, to give off vapours that will ignite. And the chances of that happening are very rare, very slim. But as I said, they do cause fires on occasions, and particularly inside houses where everything is dry, it's not being affected by humidity, and many of the internal things of the house these days are synthetics, which ignite a bit easier. And if a cigarette were to fall down the back of a couch or the side of a uh, bed or something like that, where the cigarette is insulated by the sheets or the material of the couch, then the heat is held in and it's much easily, much more likely to ignite. Mm -hmm. yes, so in this instance, the grass at the property was very fine and very low. There wasn't much of it. It was, it was only very short. So the chances of a cigarette falling into that grass, being at the temperature, being nestled in there and insulated enough to ignite the grass is extremely slim. Thank you, Mr. Walkley. <clears throat> um, sticking with that question of cigarette butts for the moment, um, in your experience, if a cigarette butt uh, is thrown into onto ground like you saw in the area of confusion for this fire, uh, if a fire had then uh, ignited around the cigarette butt, what, if any, evidence of the cigarette would you expect would survive the fire? Uh, the cigarette will remain uh, maintain its shape and size, and it's still identifiable as being a cigarette butt, even if it burnt. Now, by butt there, Mr Walkley, distinguishing between the the part of a cigarette cylinder that is the tobacco ripped in paper, so wrapped in paper, and the part of the cigarette that's the filter, uh, also wrapped in paper. Um, Probably when supposes you, it wasn't a roll your own, Mr Anderson. I was about to deal with the question of a roll your own, <laughs> Your Honour. So firstly, if it's a factory-made cigarette with the filter. Um, could you tell his honour how likely it is that the filter part of a cigarette will survive the early stages of a fire like you imagine commenced it's, in the area of confusion? It's still the same. The cigarette still maintains its shape even if it's burnt, including the, both, that's both parts, the butt and the paper. It, if it burns, unless someone goes and disturbs it by treading on it, unless the wind blows it away, you'll still maintain its shape and you should still be able to identify as what it was. All right. And turning to the possibility of a roll-your-own cigarette? That's the same situation. Um, as far as I understand with the new legislation, as I said, the, the mechanism to slow down or to stop cigarette smouldering after you in, when you're not inhaling on it is in the paper. It's, it's not in the tobacco. So as far as I'm aware, the cigarette paper that's used in roll your own cigarettes has got the same mechanism to stop it igniting. And if it burnt in the fire, it still would maintain its shape. It would still be identifiable as what it was. And Mr Walkley, when you were examining the area of confusion for this fire, did you look for signs of cigarettes? We looked on the ground for anything that was out of the normal that shouldn't be there or that may have caused the fire, anything that wasn't grass or whatever, and we did not identify any cigarettes. Thank you. <coughs> now, um, next issue, Mr Walkley, um, <coughs> you've referred in your evidence to the charcoal route that you found when you examined the area of confusion on the 6th of February. His Honour's also heard evidence of one of the TFS um, first responders who identified um, what that person thought was a still burning route on the north side of the tree stump, but much closer to the stump than the one that you had identified. Um, having regard to your observations of the area of confusion, Mr Walkley, um, what uh, is your opinion as to the question of whether the precise point of origin of the fire was the one that you had identified around the charcoal route that you found, as opposed to the possibility of the fire having started somewhere else within the area of confusion, if not precisely at the spot of the charcoal route that you had located? Yeah. What, what I've done is identified that there was a route burning under the ground, and that that route at some stage has been at the surface of the ground. I'm not saying that that was the specific route that caused this fire or that the fire started from that specific route. What I'm saying is that 
this fire started from the root system of the tree. Right, thank you. Now, in all of your investigations as to the area of confusion for this fire, Mr Walkley, did you identify any other plausible cause for the ignition of this fire unrelated to um, burning of the root system of the tree stump? No, I did not. The only plausible explanation I found during the examination I did was the root or a root was associated with the root system and the stump of that tree. Thank you, Mr. Walkley. Now, Your Honour, as I said before, Mr. Walkley first got into the witness box this morning. Um, <clears throat> uh, he has, in the um, witness statement that was served on the defendants, um, identified that he agrees to be bound by the expert witness code of conduct. And in the written statement, which I say, um, Your Honour, has not been asked to read. Um, Mr Walkley has responded to the expert reports that had been prepared by the, def uh, the first defendant's experts. Um, I propose to ask Mr Walkley for his uh, evidence in response to those uh, reports from the experts and for this purpose may Mr Walkley refer to some notes that he's prepared. I see no difficulty, Mr Reid. I, I don't know what these notes are, Your Honour, so I... Um, I Much of his own thought processes, as I understand it. Well, if that's if that's so, yes. Yeah. Uh, is that right, Mr. Armstrong? I'm, I'm sorry, or I, I missed the question. Uh, Mr. Reid said he doesn't know what's in the notes. I said I imagine that they're notes of his own thought processes. I believe that to be the case, Your Honour. Yes, all right. Well, if there's any difficulty, let me know, Mr. Reid. Yes, I'll take it to Ben Ayers. Uh, now, Mr. Walkley, do you have a copy of the notes that you prepared? Uh, by way of your responses to Mr Gilmore and Mr Thomas's reports with you in the witness box? I do. Right, thank you. Now, um, which one is it convenient to start with, Mr Walkley? Should we start with Mr Thomas or Mr Gilmore? Mr Thomas is first in my notes. Now, um, firstly, Mr Walkley, can you confirm, please, Honour, um, whose notes are they and how were they prepared? They are my notes. I took home or had sent to me uh, the reports repaired by Mr Thomas and Mr Gilmore. I sat at home and read them and I made notes and typed those notes into a document which I have in front of my name. Thank you. Now, um, starting then with Mr Thomas, Mr. Thomas's report, uh, Mr Walkley, could you tell his honour um, what, if anything, you want to say in response to the evidence that Mr Thomas is recorded as uh, giving in his report? Um, there are several items I'd just like to uh, comment on. Uh, before, but before you do so, Mr Walkley, perhaps if, just for your honour's reference, it might be convenient if Mr Walkley is going to refer to parts of Mr Thomas's report, um, although obviously I'm not tendering Mr Thomas's report, his evidence is going to be a little bit meaningless unless your honour can see what it is that he's responding to. So with your honour's permission, I'd like to bring up Mr Thomas's report so that your honour can see the passages that... Mr. Walkley is commenting so, on. I'm just a bit troubled now. Are you hearing this for the first time, Mr. Reid? Um, well, I don't know whether I am or I'm not, um, Your Honour. I, I have a uh, statement of anticipated evidence that um, uh, has a heading in it, Colin Thomas reports. Um, if that's what it is, uh, and if that is all that it is, then I'm not. Mm. Um, but otherwise, I am. All right, Mr. Armstrong, can you assist there? Uh, I expect, Your Honour, that it's going to be um, the substance that's set out in the written statement that yeah. was served on the oh, defendant. Right. Okay. If, well, if it's not and you need time, Mr Reid, yes. let me know. In the meantime, yes, I'm happy for the relevant parts of the report to be brought up. I'm assuming that'll be led by Mr Reid in due course. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. Um, <clears throat> so, Mr Thomas's first report, Your Honour, appears as Court Book Document 19. Perhaps I'll just identify each of the reports before we ask Mr Walkley to comment on them. So, document 19, exp.001.001.0392. And then if we could go back to the index, and Your Honour will see that documents 20 and 21 are Mr Thomas's um, second and third reports respectively. 
Uh, now, Mr. Walkley, against that background, firstly, could you identify uh, which of Mr. Thomas's reports you'd like to start with? I assume the first report. The first report. All right. Could we bring up document 19 then, please? And then, um, by reference to the paragraph numbers in Mr. Thomas's report, if you can, please, Mr. Walkley, could you then take his honour through the comments that you wish to make in response to Mr. Thomas's first report? The first comment is relates basically to Mr. Thomas's credentials, and I've worked with Mr. Thomas on many occasions in the past when he was a police fire scene examiner and as a private investigator, and I'm not aware of Mr. Thomas having any qualifications to investigate wildfires or bushfires. I, I had a reservation about, about that matter, that's all. And what kind of qualification would you expect a, um, a person to have before you regarded them as um, qualified to investigate a wildfire? What kind of assessment or examination do you have in mind as being the relevant qualification? I would expect the person to have done a, um, a course which involves uh, training, assessment, uh, assessment on theory aspects of fire investigation, wildfire investigation, and some practical component to prove that that person was capable of investigating a bushfire. All right, thank you. Um, <coughs> now moving on then from the question of qualifications, what's next? Um, Mr. Thomas's suggestion in paragraph 3.6 of his report. All right, and it might be better for the transcript if uh, you said what that was, okay. and yep. uh, then say what you want to say about it. Otherwise, no, I'm I couldn't see. I couldn't see it, is, Your Honour. Sorry. Backwards and forwards. Okay. His, his, Mr. Thomas's comment, excavation of the soil and rocks around this route was conducted using a small garden trowel and paintbrush. Mm -hmm. The soil and rocks were removed in a similar format to an archaeological dig, with all root structure being exposed. It's going on to say that photographs show this process. I have some serious reservations about that comment in that uh, his photographs that he refers to show, from what I can see, a pick and a shovel, not a small garden trowel or paintbrush. So clearly to me, a pick and a shovel were used in his excavation. The other thought I had in this was that he has said that all root structure was exposed. And that is not the fact that there was never has, never will be, all the root structure exposed. Parts of it were, but not all of it. All right, and what's the significance to your mind, Mr. Walkley, of the fact that <coughs> um, uh, Mr. Thomas used a larger tool than you would have expected? Uh, well, when I did the excavation with Mr. Bones and Mr. Johnson, we used only small trowels, and anything bigger than that around that route that we were excavating would have totally destroyed it. And I've already explained to Your Honour how when we were using even small trowels, how difficult it was to maintain the integrity of that route system. And when I see a shovel from Mr Thomas's photo in the ground, uh, basically on the roots or in the area where we were digging away with roots, I have serious reservations as to how he could have maintained the integrity of that scene by using such a tool. Thank you. <coughs> uh, what's next, Mr Walker? As I said earlier on, it took myself and Mr Johnson and Mr Bones several hours to, to excavate that little area that we did. And where Mr Thomas has said the entire root structure was exposed, I not only find that, that the photographs don't show that, but had that done and occurred, it would have taken days and days and several people to do that task. And, and while doing that task, 
to do would have destroyed any evidence that was there in the root system. Just before you move on, please, Mr. <coughs> Walkley, could we go in Mr. Thomas's report to photograph 13, which is at about page uh, EXP 0. That's it, thank you. Um, <coughs> now, Mr. Walkley, what seems to be shown in that photograph is a fairly extensive excavation. Um, given your answer or your comment <coughs> a moment ago, um, how does what you see in the photograph there relate to the observations that you just made to his honour? That, that confirms my observations that I just made and the comments I just made, that the entire root structure is, is not and hasn't been entirely excavated. The root system of a large tree like that would have a diameter, I'd imagine, of at least 10 metres from, from the centre of the tree. And that clearly shows that there, that, that is not a 10 metre or anywhere near a 10 metre excavation. And it is only excavated in one probably quadrant of the circumference of the tree. All right, thank you. Now, you said a 10 metre diameter from the uh, centre of the system. Do you mean diameter or radius? Oh, I don't really know because I don't have, know how big that tree was before it burned down. And, but I do know it was a rather large tree and I do know that the canopy of a tree is usually the radius of where the root system goes to. And because I didn't see the tree before it burnt down, I can't really comment. I'm not a um, botanist who can make a really good comment on that. Thank you. What's next? Um, in Mr. Thomas's report, paragraph 2.1.1 of his, sorry, his 2020 report. This, I think, is his second report? Yep. Thank you. That's not the one. 2.1.1. So we go to document 20 in the court book. <coughs> Is that it, Mr Walker? That's the one. Thank you. So Mr Thomas, who... Firstly, Mr. Walker, for Sorry. The purposes of transcript, could you just yep. um, summarise the point that you are now responding to? Uh, Mr. Thomas was asked questions whether and if so, what area of origin could be identified or can be identified, whether and if so, what point of origin can be identified, and whether and if so, what ignition source can be identified. And Mr. Thomas's response to that was, on my initial attendance at the fire scene, the burn indicators observed were, in my opinion, inconclusive to the extent that it was not possible to determine an approximate area of fire origin, let alone a point of fire origin or an ignition source. My concern with that comment is that Mr Thomas, who arrived at the scene about eight months after the fire, eight months after I attended, said that the, he could not determine that information that he was asked. And that there was an obvious, that there was, uh, sorry. Yet, Mr Gilmore, in a later report, who visited the scene almost seven years after Mr Thomas and after me, was able to interpret fire language to indicate to him where the fire started, which made me gave me concerns again about Mr Thomas's ability to determine our fire origin in a bushfire scenario. Uh, can I just... Have you finished with that point, Mr Walker? No, uh, there's another one. 
which at paragraph 2.3 of his 2018 report, sorry to go back. Yeah, that's okay. <coughs> so the 2018 report is um, document 19. His first report that we saw a moment ago. there, Mr. Walkley, at 2.3. Yes, 2.3. Mr. Thomas has referred to time lapses. Yep. Mr. Thomas has said that due to time lapses involved in the Tasmania Fire Service investigations, there was obvious disturbance of fire debris between the fire service's departure from the scene and my subsequent attendance. Despite this, I do not believe my examination of the root structure of what I'll refer to as a subject stump was compromised in any way. So what I find of interest there is Mr Thompson is saying the disturbance of the scene was considerable and earlier he said he could not determine an area of origin or point of or origin yet he had no trouble determining that a route did not cause the fire which seems to me to be a uh, in contradiction of what he was saying about the disturbance of the evidence. Right, thank you. Um, now, what's next, Mr. Walker? <coughs> uh, this is an overall observation, and I can't refer to his notes. As I've said earlier on, my investigation, we started from an area quite a distance away from where we determined the point of origin to be and worked our way from that area into the, an area of origin, an area of confusion, and finally a point of origin, or a possible point of origin. That is a standard way to investigate a fire, to go from the extremities into the, where we think it started. It seems to me that Mr Thompson has gone to the property and gone straight to the point of origin. Now, the problem there is that if you go, don't do the periphery, as we had done, then move into the middle where it had begun, then you risk severely destroying any evidence before you even start investigating what you're looking for. And so it seems to me that Mr Thomas has, has missed a few steps in the normal investigation where you would start from areas of least damage or areas less likely to have caused the fire and to go straight to the area where it started is probably an incorrect procedure. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Walkley, can I just pause you there? Um, Mr Thomas, if one assumes for present purposes that Mr Thomas uh, went out to the property and undertook his investigation for the purpose of assessing whether he agreed with the conclusion that you had reached as to the point of origin of the fire, um, what then is the relevance of the observation you just made about not starting at the periphery and working back? Well, it seems to me that Mr Thomas was un unable to identify the fire language to be able to take him to that area where it started. So he's just gone merely on what other people have said. Um, what's next? That was all on Mr Thomas. Thank you. Um, now, in relation to Mr. Gilmore, Mr. Walkley. Um, so again, Your Honour, Mr. Gilmore's prepared, I think, two reports. The first one is the longer one, and it is document 15 in the court book, exp.001.001.0233. And then there is a very short uh, document that calls itself a statement, uh, which is document 16 in the court book, exp.001.001.0356. We can just bring that up as well. And because this one is so short, Mr. Walkley, can I just draw your attention to it? If we go down the screen, please, Mr. Temponi. And you see that this one deals with the issue of steam. 
So having refreshed your memory by reference to Mr Gilmore's um, what we'll call supplementary statement, um, could you now um, tell His Honour what comments or responses you would like to make to either of Mr Gilmore's two reports? Um. I may comment on this one first, where, he's, where the sighting of steam, in my view, could possibly have been caused by point three, puffs of airborne fine ash when disturbed by wind. Uh, I think it's um, most people will be able to determine what the difference is between ash and and steam. They're two different, totally different things. Uh, all my other comments relate to his first report. Thank you. And this is where we go back to what I said about Mr Thomas. Could not um, determine burn patterns to take him anywhere, but on point 343 of Mr Gilmore's report, uh, Mr Walkley, are you referring to a, a section number or a paragraph number or a page number? Uh, you can look at page 92. That's where, Mr. Gil, that's where Mr Gilmore has said, we are mindful of the fact that our examination took place almost five years after the event. However, there was still enough of what might be called macro burn and char patterns present throughout the property to provide us with reliable indicators of the fire's behaviour and its direction of movement. That was all on that. What's next? If we can go to page 97. Point 350. We're in the paragraph with the heading, the old stump. Uh, Mr Gilmore stated, we excavated the same site as the TFS investigators and Colin Thomas. However, the lines of coals, burnt roots, to which the TFS referred to in their report are not connected to the old stump. The coals were traced us by us back to another stump. I have not seen anything from Mr Gilmore or Mr Thomas to identify that they have dug up the same route that we dug up. In fact, Mr Thomas's photographs show that he was digging the surface probably 20 centimetres above the, where we were digging. So I don't see where uh, Mr Gilmore can be confident that he dug up the same route that we did, whereas it, as he has said he's done. He then goes on after that paragraph to say, there are many stumps within the area of origin. Many showed signs of having burnt. <clears throat> I recall only one stump in the area of origin that I identified, and not many and not even two, but just the one. We go to paragraph B. Um, just before we move off that proposition, please, Mr Walkley, could we go back to Mr Thomas's first report and the image that you saw a moment ago, which was photograph 13 on page 0402. Can I draw your attention to the two uh, objects? I think we can agree that they look like roots or tree stumps or something on the left-hand side of the photograph. Yes, they do. Um, now, given your um, comment to His Honour a moment ago about there not being other stumps in the area that you excavated, um, uh, what do you say is shown in this photograph and how does it bear on the evidence that you just gave? I believe that all be the one and the same 
Stamm. Can I, can I make reference to one of Mr. Bones's photographs? Yes, please. Good, uh... <clears throat> if you tell me the page number of the photograph, we'll bring it up on screen. Page 48, photograph 30. That's court book page 0203 in <coughs> behind document 50. Page 0203. And scroll down the page. Thank you. That photograph shows the stump as I know the stump. It was the only stump in the area of origin. Thank you. Uh, what's the next point in response to Mr Gilmore, please, Mr Walker? Uh, page 97 again. Uh, paragraph B. Um, Mr Gilmore is suggesting that children on the property playing for a possible cause, I know of no evidence to suggest that there were children at the time or immediately prior to the fire, to have caused the fire. Uh, paragraph C, Mr Gilmore has stated that um, there is a power line in the area and could that have caused the fire? Um, in anything associated with that power line, could have caused the fire? Mr Bones, who of, as I've said earlier on, had electrical inspectors inspect everything to do with electricity in the area and everything was discounted that associated with electricity. And that includes point D, a power lead that was used at the rear of the house. Also excludes paragraph E, an electric pump, which was at the house. It also excludes paragraph F, an electric fence at the house. At paragraph G, Mr Gilmore suggests that motor vehicles may have been associated with the cause of the fire, be it faulty brakes or an exhaust system. Uh, I am aware that motor vehicles can cause fires, in, particularly in grass, particularly in long grass, where the grass is very dry and the grass can be in contact with the exhaust system, uh, particularly catalytic converters. They can get quite hot and sufficiently hot to ignite grass, particularly if they're not working properly. However, there was no evidence or information I've been given to say that there was a motor vehicle anywhere near where this fire started. And had there been a motor vehicle in this area, then the grass was clearly too short to be touching the exhaust system or the brake systems of the car. So I discount a motor vehicle as being part of the cause. Uh, go to paragraph H. Mr Gilmore suggested cigarettes may have been associated with the cause. I've already gave my opinion on that subject. Would you like it again, Your Honour? No, thank you. In paragraph I, suggested by Mr Gilmore that arson is a possibility. This is the one possibility that I cannot discount. An arsonist can light a fire and there can be no evidence left behind if he just used a portable ignition source like a cigarette lighter. The, that leaves me no evidence to say yes or no, that's not possible. However, I know of no information to suggest that arson was a possibility. Uh, he, Mr Gilmore's report in paragraph J suggests lightning as a possible cause. This was discounted by Mr Barnes by conferring with the Bureau of Meteorology. Paragraph K suggests a spot fire from a separate fire may have been a cause. And I know of no information to indicate that this is a possibility. He further goes in point I to say spontaneous combustion is a potential source of ignition. I think that's L, isn't it? Uh, K, yeah, L, sorry. 
uh, I, I saw nothing to indicate that there was anything in that area or anywhere near that area that could have posed as possible spontaneous combustion ignition source. need some help to indicate a solar light that Mr Gilmore made comment I can't find where that reference is. Uh, <clears throat> it's um, on page 54. Uh, figure 23. Okay. Mr. Mr. Gilmore. Sorry, Mr. Walker. Before Sorry. You, before you go on, perhaps Mr. Temponi could enlarge the photograph a little bit. And could you identify, Mr. Walkley, um, what you understand to be the solar light that's referred to? Yeah, at the lower centre of the photo, there's a a silvery object. That's the solar light. Thank you. Mr. Gilmore suggested that that was a potential source or cause of the fire. Uh, there's a few comments on that one. One is the solar light is outside the area of origin. But I'd also like to say that I don't recall seeing that light there on that day. I'm not saying that I didn't see it, I just don't recall seeing it. Uh, now, there's a few potential ignition sources with the solar light. One is that the batteries could overheat. There's no indication from this photograph that the batteries of that light have overheated. Uh, there's a possibility, slight as it is, that, that there could have been arcing within the solar light. However, the damage would have been confined to the interior of the light, and the light would have been damaged by that if that had occurred. Mr Gilmore also suggests that the lens of that light could have refracted and then magnified the sunlight to cause the grass to catch on fire. And looking at the picture, that is not laughable, but extremely unlikely, because the glass is not glass, it'd be plastic, it'd be frosted plastic, and you can see that it's frosted, it's not clear, and the possibility of that refracting and magnifying glass and igniting grass is pretty much impossible. Well, it's in gravel apart from anything else, isn't it? It seems to be in mostly gravel. Can we have that up a little bit, please, Mr. Tempone? <laughs> Yes, thank you. So, Mr Gilmore's report that suggests that that solar light, that particular solar light, was associated with cause, I totally discount. Mr Gilmore makes comment throughout his report on several places about glass causing fires. I, I don't want to, I don't think I need to reiterate. No, thank you. At several places in Mr Gilmore's report, and I don't have the paragraphs here, he makes comment to unknown materials being potential ignition sources. I can't make comment on something that's unknown, so I can't really make comment on what is said there. Also, Mr Gilmore states that he was unable to pinpoint a point of fire origin but his proposed area of fire origin is very, very close to being the same as my area of origin. So I've got no uh, argument against that. I'm just saying that he confirms what we were saying with his interpretation of the fire language that he observed some five to eight years later. Now, Mr Walkley, was Mr Gilmore's area of fire origin exactly the same as yours? No, it's not. What was the main difference? He's... he's 
evidence suggests that he believes the area of origin could be expanded from the area that I've identified to an area behind the house which included a big log and the septic tank system. Now, could I pause you there please Mr Walkley and Mr Temponi, could you bring up document 101 and can we go to photograph 63? Could we zoom into the <coughs> um, area of the house, please, Mr. Temponi, as large as you can get it? Pause about there. Now, <coughs> uh, Mr. Walkley is on his um, seen the big log, and uh, I think we can all agree that the big log is shown to the right of the photograph, roughly in line with the far edge of the roof of the house. Is that the big log? That's Did correct. You understand it? That's correct. Now, um, could you tell His Honour what investigations you conducted in the area um, of the big log or the septic tank, um, looking at questions of fire direction or fire origin, and what were your conclusions from those investigations? As I said earlier on in my mm. information, I stood on the edge of the gully, which is just over from where that big log is, and it was clear that the fire in this area has come up from the gully, from a, a free burning fire, and trickled across the grass into that area. It hasn't gone the other way around. And those trees had crowned, I think you said. Sorry? And those trees had crowned. I yes, that's correct. Said. Yes. So I discounted that as being an area of origin, and that is why it's not included in the area of origin that I determined. Uh, and further to that, um, not only the physical fire language didn't indicate that. When I spoke to Miss Barrett on her balcony, we could see in that general direction, we couldn't see all of that area, but she was definite in the fact that the only place she saw fire burning was the area straight over 20 metres from her balcony towards the west, oh, sorry, towards the east. Um, Mr Walkley, what's next? One final thing, Mr Gilmore refers in his report to using a CSIRO grassland fire spread meter. He has used that to come up with his determinations of fire spread. Uh, that, there is such a thing as a CSIRO grassland fire meter, but it has never been used in Tasmania. It's, it doesn't suit Tasmania's landscape. What it does suit is some of the mainland uh, vast expanses of paddock type areas. It's, we were aware of it in Tasmania, but we never use it. And that's by any of the fire jurisdiction, whether it be uh, forestry or parks or Tasmania Fire Service. Thank you. Uh, was that it in relation to Mr Gilmore? It is. Mr Walkley. Thank you. Now, <coughs> um, Mr Walkley, have you had a chance to... Oh, I'm sorry, in the, um, at the end of your investigation, was it you who were responsible for preparing the fire investigation report? on behalf of the TFS? No, it was not. No. Um, have you read that report? I have. Uh, when was the first time you read it? I don't remember. It was back when Mr Bones finished the report. It was after he finished the report. I don't remember when that was. Thank you. And um, have you read it recently before giving your evidence to His Honour? Yes, I have. Are there any um, uh, comments or conclusions or observations in the report that you wish to comment on? Yes, just one, I believe. In the findings of the Tasmania Fire Service report... Could I just pause you there, Mr. Yep. I'm sorry, I should have brought this up. Yep. It's, um, it's behind document 50 and it's at page 0156. You referred to the conclusions, Mr. Walkley, which I think appear at page one double eight. Yes. In the second paragraph, uh, sentence number three. 
where Mr Bones has said in his summary, when the slow burning, slow smouldering roots have reached the surface some six days later and come in contact with the atmosphere, free burning has been initiated. High temperature and strong wind has carried embers to nearby grasses, igniting them. I don't totally agree with that finding. I, I agree that it started from the root system, but I think it's more likely that the root system has burnt through to the surface of the ground and that it's the burning ember has come in direct contact with grass immediately adjacent to where it was, rather than sparks being carried around the place. Now, Mr Walkley, just while we're on that sentence, <coughs> um, the part that you just read out referred to, on the one hand, sl slow smouldering, and then, then on the other hand, free burning. Could you explain to His Honour um, what are the phenomena or mechanisms um, that it, to your understanding, describes slow smouldering on one hand and free burning on the other hand? Yes. If we can make, if I can make reference to this particular scenario of, of a root burning under the ground, in that scenario there's insufficient oxygen for free burning to occur. So in the atmosphere we've got 21% oxygen and underground when the root is surrounded by dirt it doesn't have access to that amount of oxygen. So therefore it can't go into the free burning stage. But it does go through a stage which is known as pyrolysis. And in that stage, it is still the the material being subject to the heat is still decomposing, but it's not in a free burning state. So it does decompose, and eventually it will turn to charcoal. But it will take much longer than a free burning fire. Now, with the root system burning underground, and in that state of pyrolysis, it will remain there till it finds some oxygen. So then it will come to the surface, which is what I've explained before. As soon as the oxygen level is returned to its normal, the 21%, that slow smouldering pyrolysis process will change into a free burning process and the ember will then start to glow red and much hotter. But on a close reading of that paragraph, is there really any difference between you and Mr Bones? Because no, no, the only difference is... No, uh, no, no, hear, hear me. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just read it to you. Um, I'm sorry, on a careful reading. He says, when the sl slow smouldering roots have reached the surface some six days later and come into contact with the atmosphere, free burning has been initiated. And then he says, comma, high temperature and strong wind has carried an ember to nearby dry grasses, uh, igniting them. So he's not really disagreeing with you at all? No, no. What, what, the only thing I slightly disagree with is the high winds carrying embers from the root to nearby grasses. No, but he's not saying that. He, he's saying free burning had been initiated. I agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. So free burning got to be burning of something. Yes, it is. And I agree totally with that. It's that the only part I disagree with is I, I believe the root has come to the surface yep. and grass immediately adjacent to that root has started burning and not that the root has started throwing embers or being embers from that root blowing away. Well, that's sort of how I read that report, but if there's, uh, if there's any difference between you, we'll find out about it. It's very close. It's he's, just... he, he's talking about a two-stage process, and so are you. So. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <coughs> um, now, one last matter, uh, Mr Walkley. Um, for the purpose of preparing your um, statement that's been... Um, filed in this proceeding, you were provided with the transcript of an interview conducted by Tasmania Police with Ms Barrett, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and that was an interview conducted on 7th of January 2013. I, I was given several, so I don't know if that was the one that you're referring to or not. Uh, well, there was one, um, Mr Walkley and His Honour has heard the interview itself, where Ms Barrett refers to having seen steam yes. rising from the area of the stump or around the stump a few days prior to the fire. Um, yes, I am aware of that one. Could you please explain to His Honour what, if any, relevance that uh, observation has for your conclusions as to the probable cause of this bushfire? Well, what that statement does is support what I'm saying, that the fire was burning underground. Um, the occupants believe their fire to be out. However, even after they thought it was out, they still observed steam coming from the ground. So the stump may have been out, 
but the underground structure of the stump clearly wasn't. Otherwise, the steam wouldn't have been there. Um, it wasn't. The dirt is obviously what is hot, and something has to make the dirt hot. And that, the only thing that remained other than the stump was the root system. All right, thank you. I said there was one last matter. I was inadvertently misleading you. Um, one other issue that's arisen over the course of this proceeding very recently, Mr Walkley, is the possibility that um, the cause of the underground smouldering route was a, a rubbish burn-off fire that was lit on, in or around the stump in about September 2012, so three months roughly before this fire. Based on your examination of the soil conditions, the vegetation, all of the features of the um, area of confusion that you consider relevant, could you please tell His Honour what is your um, view as to the feasibility of the suggestion that the burning root system that you identified might have been burning since about September 2012. I find that um, pretty unbelievable, to tell the truth. Um, for three months burning, the only fires I know of that will burn for three months without being either using up its own fuel and going out because there's no fuel left to burn, or because unless the weather conditions put the fire out. The only types of fire I know or aware of are really big windrows. Do you know what a windrow is, Your mm -hmm. Honour? It's a row of logs and stumps. Mm -hmm. Shot many rabbits standing on the top yeah. of a windrow. Well, 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 really large windrows where there's a huge fuel load will tend to burn for a long time, and that could be months. The only other scenario I know is when peat burns in the bush mm. and those peat piles can be not they're not piles they're natural phenomena out the bush they can be meters and meters deep and once again a huge fuel load that can burn for months I'm never I'm not aware of any incident where a fuel load as small as one log or one stump could burn for three months All right, thank you um, now apart from the um, possible uh, difference with Mr Bones in relation to the reference to embers at the end of uh, the fire investigation report that he authored. Um, Mr Walkley, do you otherwise agree with the conclusions that are set out in the fire investigation report? I do. Thank you. I will tend to that now, if it's convenient to Your Honour. That's the fire investigation report? It is, Your Honour. It's uh, WTS.00. CB50, isn't it? Uh, it's, well, the whole of CB50 includes Mr Walkley's written statement, and that's not uh, to be tendered. So it's 0156? Yes, Your Honour. For the transcript, WTS.001.001.0156. Mm -hmm. And I think I've already tendered his CV, Your Honour. If I haven't, I need yes, to. Yes, you have. Your Honour, um, Provided Mr Bones comes along, there's no objection to it. If he doesn't, I'll be taking a 136 objection. Mm. Well, I imagine Mr Bones is to be called. Uh, he is to be called, John. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Your Honour, that was all for Mr Walkley in chief, if it please. Yes, thanks. Mr Reid. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Walkley, you didn't find a burning root system, did you? No, it was not burning at the time. No. What you found was a burnt root system. That's correct. And you had nothing at all from what you saw to indicate when that burning had occurred, did you? No, we did not. Now, um, I want to, if you could just look at document 80, please. Scroll. It's just that first page of it, I think, will do. Uh, you recognise that is your personal incident logbook? That's correct. For this incident? That's correct. Yes. And could you please scroll down? Keep going. Thank you, Mr Tempone. Uh, now, uh, the 3rd of January is mentioned, uh, 
with your movements to Cambridge, correct? That's correct. Uh, the fourth, again mentioned. That's correct. The fifth. And then over the next page, the sixth, which is the relevant day. Um, and your note there is left home, FI, fire right. investigation. That's correct. Force at fire and returned home at 7 p.m. That's correct. Um, now, the sixth was the only day that you visited 242 White Hill Road, isn't it? Other than a flight over White Hills Road the day after, or the two days after. Or the day, the sixth actually, Mr Walkley, wasn't it? No, I think it was the day after or the two days after. We'll come from, from memory, I don't believe we flew over on the same day. Yeah, we'll come, come back to that. Yeah. Um, now, apart from that document that we are looking at, we've not been provided by any notes that you took of anything that occurred on the 6th of January. Um, are we missing something or did you not take any notes? No, you're missing nothing. I took no notes. Um, any notes that were being taken were taken by Mr Bones. He was the one doing the report and not me. And um, what did you see him noting? I didn't look at his notes, so I have no idea. Right. So you didn't uh, instruct him to note anything? No, not at all. Did you take any samples? No, I did not. Did you take any photos? No, I did not. You relied upon Mr Bones and Police Officer Needham for photographs, correct? Oh, I'm not sure of the police officer's name. If Was it Lindsay Needham? Mr yeah. Needham, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mr yeah. Needham, yeah, that's correct. Yes. In any event, there was a police officer there and you were relying upon him and Mr Bones for photos. That's correct. Thank you. Now, could the witness please be shown the memorandum of understanding? I understand this may not be in the book. You see um, this document it commences. Have, have you seen this before? A long time ago. I believe I might have seen it. It might be easier if I um, provide you with a hard copy. Very rare occasion I've got some paper um, so that Mr Tempano doesn't have to scroll and you can you can look at it. Uh, copy for under might be helpful. I, I you, you've got it? I can see it like Yeah, thank I'll you. Hide the copy. It obviously was in the court. All ah, right. Okay. Thank yes, it's my my error that it hasn't been, mm. Your Honour. Certainly not, Mr. Tempano's. You could just scroll through it for my benefit, Mr. Tempano. That's it. I, I might um, be mistaken. I might have the wrong copy. I've got the copy I have is one that is hasn't been signed off by the Tasmanian Fire Services at this date. It's only been signed off by the police and it says on the front page that the copy is for attention by your agency and the other is to be, oh sorry, um, these documents have been endorsed by the Commissioner of Police and require endorsement from the TFS, which indicates to me they hadn't been endorsed at this stage by the TFS. This might be an early copy. No, my question, uh, Mr Walker, is whether you'd seen this before. I, that's, I'm not sure if it was, it was a long time ago. Right, well, can you have a look please at the document? Yes. Um, you'll see that there are some general principles on page, on the third page of the fourth page actually of the uh, document you've got, general principles. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. Arrangements for the examination and investigation of fire scenes between TASPOL and the TF and the TFS are underpinned by the following general principles. Examination and oh. investigation of fire scenes will be conducted. I think I'm on the wrong page, sorry. Could you choose? Give me the page again, please. Page, page one of one. At the top left-hand corner is the word introduction. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, no, still not. Keep going. 
One of one. Introduction, yes. yes. You've got that with introduction at the top. Yes. You see general principles. The arrangements for the examination and investigation of fire scenes between TASPOL and the TFS are underpinned by the following general principles. The examination and investigation of fire scenes will be conducted in accordance with these guidelines. Um, and down at dot point four, I won't read them all to you, but please take your time if you need to. TFS will conduct fire scene assessments, fire cause investigations to determine uh, and report on the origin and cause of fires. You see that? It was your understanding in 2012 and the first couple of weeks of 2013 that those general principles uh, for the arrangements for the examination and investigation of fire scenes were in force. That's reasonable, yes. Thank you. And um, you'll see that uh, um, fire scene fire scene assessment rather um, is, is defined on the next page to mean preliminary assessment of a fire scene by a TFS officer to categorise the fire as either deliberate, accidental or undetermined. And that was the common definition at that time, wasn't it? Generally, I believe so, yes. Yes, and above that, fire cause investigation means the thorough inve in examination of a fire scene by a fire scene investigator to determine the origin and cause of a fire. That again was the um, was the general principle in force at the time of your investigation, wasn't it? That's correct. Thank you. Um, and do you see on page um, three of three, scene management, general principles. The following general principles were applied to the management of a fire scene. TFS will respond to the fire as soon as possible. Preserve the incident scene to prevent scenes from contamination or loss of evidence and maintain log sheets and other relevant documentation. Do you see that? That's correct. And that was in force at the time of your investigation, wasn't it? I believe so. Thank you. And um, you will see um, on page six of six, sampling and evidence gathering. Responsibility. Responsibility for the identification, collection and analysis of fire samples rests with the TFS, where the samples are to assist with determining the origin and cause of the fire. That was a responsibility of the TFSs at the time that you were at the fire scene on the 6th. That's correct. Thank you. And um, finally, storing storage and security at the bottom of that page. Uh, TFS is responsible for the storage, security and continuity of items taken by fire scene investigators um, and the rest, it, it goes on from there. That was in place at the time you did your investigation. As best as my memory right. serves me, this. Now, you left all of that, did you, to Mr Barnes? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, did Mr Bones take samples of the charcoal to which you refer? Not that I'm aware of. Did Mr Bones take samples of the dirt around the charcoal? Um, I don't believe so. Did he take any samples of the stump? No, he didn't. Those samples would have assisted in determining the, the cause of the fire, wouldn't they? I don't believe so. If if you can explain why, then I'm happy to answer. Well, if his honour had on cotton wool, the charcoal that you're referring to, um, he could be satisfied in relation to it. Satisfied as to what, Your Honour? Well, Sorry, that's an objection, Mr Walkley. Um, his honour could be said, well, I could satisfied, be satisfied that it was charcoal on cotton wool, if I knew the difference between charcoal and anything else. Exactly. Thank you, Your Honour. You could be satisfied of that, couldn't you, Mr Walkley? Can you? I was interrupted. I was about to say I thought I would have thought that the photographs of charcoal would suffice. Did you direct that any photographs be taken? No, Mr Bones directed all the photographs that he wanted taken. It was his report, so that was his duty. Right. Could document 101 please be brought up? Photograph 58. <coughs> Now, you've 
seen this photograph before. Do you recall that that is um, one of the... F Sorry, I'll go back. Do you recall that when you were in the air after your examination on the 6th, whether it be the next day or the day after, or indeed the same day, that photographs, aerial photographs were taken? Yes, they were taken. And do you recognise this as um, the view which you had from the aircraft? Yes, I do. And, oh, sorry. Can, can I, I have this particular photo, I, if I've seen it, it would have been a long time ago. This particular photograph is not in Barry, Mr Bones' report. Mm -hmm. And even though he may not have submitted all his photos, I, I, I recognise this as being the area we flew over. I recognise it as being the house. I recognise the area of origin, but I don't recognise seeing this particular photo. And if I did, it was a long time ago. I'm asking about the view shown in the photo rather than the photo Yeah, the, the view, I believe. Is, I've, I've seen it, that's what I said. I have seen the photo, I just haven't seen the photograph. Now, the aircraft that you went in was a helicopter? That's correct. Who went with you? Mr Bones. Mr Needham? No, I don't believe so. Just you and Mr Bones? Yep. If this uh, photograph could be enlarged, please. No, I'm sorry, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. Thank you. Um, Before you commenced this investigation, do you recall that photographs were taken of the general area from the balcony of the house, or from the area of the balcony of the house, not necessarily on the balcony, uh, to the east? Uh, I don't recall because I didn't take the photographs. No. Well, let me phrase it another way. The evidence you gave this morning indicated that you went to a point A um, and I wasn't sure whether you went there immediately or whether you went on to the property first. No, we drove up the driveway first Yes. and then got out of the vehicles. I went and spoke to the lady who lived at the house and then we walked down back down the driveway. We drove up back to point A that I described earlier today. Right. Could... Um Photograph 28, uh, sorry, document 100, photograph 28. Now, I appreciate you didn't take the photographs, um, Mr Walkley, but did you get into that area before you went down to point A, where the, where the photographer is standing? No, I didn't. Did Mr Bones? I have no idea. Were you with Mr Bones, were you not? I was with him, but that was nine years ago. I don't remember everywhere he walked while I was talking to the lady. The next photograph, please. Who is in that, um, that picture? Do you recognise anyone? No, as, as I said, um, when I met at Fawcett, and went with Mr Bones. There were police officers and I said that. And I also said that I don't didn't know any of those police officers. I don't remember. But I, I can't identify any of those people. It's, right. Unless I can... Can we zoom in? The people on the right I might be able to. That's, that appears to be Mr Bones, the second from the left. Not where the cursor is. There, yeah, where the cursor is there now. That's Mr Bones, yes. That's Mr Bones. Yes, do you recognise anyone else? No. It's, it's obviously a police officer on the left. Uh, it seems to me a police officer on the far right. And a police officer on the second from the right. So when you're talking about left and right, you do you... Saying as we look at the photograph, or as... as as we look at the photograph. Right. So, police officer to the left. Then we've got another police officer. Is no, that right? No. Police officer on the left. Then Mr. Bones. Then Mr. Bones. Thank you. Yeah. Now I understood you had Mr. Bones to the right of the photograph. No, sorry. Ah, thank you. Uh, and then two more police officers. I believe that is the case, from what I can see. Right. Now, do you recall uh, when you met at um, Fawcett that? Mr. Terenius was there. No, I don't remember that. Right. 
Do you remember being um, present when he was interviewed? No, I don't remember. Recall that. I don't believe I was. Right. We have a look at the next photograph, please. Now, the same. Sorry, is the only person you recognise in that photograph, Mr. Bones? And you see the second from the left as we look into the photograph. No, Mr. Bones looks to be the first from the left. He's the one with his arm out to the right. Yes, the, right. it seems to me. Yes. It looks to me like Mr. Bones. And who's that next to him? No, can we zoom in, please? Well, he's wearing a police officer's cap, so I assume it's a police officer, so, but, I, but I don't know him. Right. And move across, please. Again, you don't know other of those police officers, I assume? No. Right. Thank you. Um, now, we have to document um, 101 photo 7, please. Do you agree that that photograph shows the area of the stump and the point of to which you were about to excavate, in other words, before the excavation starts? Mm, it's obviously before we excavate it. And can you just say that again, the question, please? It, well, that's really what I want to know. It's obviously before you excavate it. Yeah, it was obviously before we dug right. it up. Thank you. Um, we have a look at uh, that. Sorry, I've lost the number that I asked for. That's photo 50, was it? No, no, photo 7, sorry. Uh, now can we go to um, um, document, uh, to photo 50. And do you agree that that photograph shows the full extent of the excavation? Yeah, pretty much, I believe so. Just have a look at the next photograph, please. Um, again, the full extent of the excavation. Yes. Yeah, and again, the next photo. Same. There's been no more digging. No. Thank you. And the next photo. Now, as to that, that again shows there's been no more digging. That's so. That's correct. Who applied the pink... Um, dust, if it's dust. Paint. Oh, it's, it's spray paint. It's spray lime, paint. It's lime paint. It's lime paint. Yeah. Who applied I, it? I do not remember. Right. Uh, and do you have any uh, recollection as to what that is intended to depict? The line that the charcoal route was taking as we were undigging it. Now, were did you ask for any photographs to be taken of the actual dig? I was, as I said earlier, I didn't take, ask anyone to take any photos. That was what Barry um, Bones was doing. Right. Where was Barry Bones during the dig? I can't say for the entire time of it. He could have been there for some of it. He could have been there for nearly all of it. I know he's there for most of it, but I can't say categorically that he was there every moment they were digging. And if he wasn't there, I don't know where he was. I, it was... I can't remember. It was nine years ago. Could we go back um, backwards along the photographs, please? Just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Right. And just uh, just keep going backwards, please. Um, and keep going. I'm sorry if I can just if I can just go forward again. I'm sorry. Thank you to that one. Uh, 
Can we note the number of that one, please, Mr. Tempano? It's number 0034. So the excavation had started by that time. Had it finished? Is that a complete excavation? I don't think this one is. The one where the shovel was in the hole would be more likely to be the end of the excavation. The one that you showed me earlier on? Yes. You think there's more excavation to be done after that one? After this one, I think. Right. From what I can see by the photos, uh, this one doesn't show the hole that we dug when we was trying to trace, like, burrow up into where the charcoal was. So this, to me, was earlier than our final excavation. Can we go forward to 35, please? The next photo. Does that help you as to whether there was further excavation? You can see yeah, it, some charcoal seemed, on a rock. It, it seems to me we've done more excavation more, after that. More after that, thank you. Um, now, you say it's several hours from the time that you first did the excavation until you completed it. That's been your evidence today? Yeah, from my memory, it was several hours. I'm not sure exactly how many hours. Well, it'll be more than one. It was more than one. Um, if you want more specific, uh, from memory, I think we were there digging for around about three hours. But I cannot be categorically say that is how long it was. All right. Well, can we have a look at uh, document 101, photo 7, please? That's the one that we showed you that um, where the digging had yet to commence. Is that right? That's correct. Right. We have a look at the metadata of that, please, Mr. Tempono. And we'll see that metadata of that photograph tells us that it was gone too far, I think, Mr. Timpano. Yeah, well, I don't think so. I think it showed three three fifty PM, didn't it? No. No. It shouldn't have. This is one twenty four PM. One one twenty four. 1.24 p.m. So you'd agree then, would you? No, it's an unfair question. Um, I want you to accept that the uh, photograph that you've looked at, that you've accepted where the excavation has not commenced, was taken at 1.24 p.m. I'd accept that. Right. Now, we could have a look at photograph number 50, please. Just get... Photo 50 up for a moment to make sure we've got the right one. And that's the photograph where the excavation is complete. I've accepted that. Yep. And the metadata for that shows, please, it was taken when? At 2.07 p.m. So there are not several hours between 1.24 p.m. and 2.07 p.m., are they, Mr. Walker? Obviously not. You did not take several hours to conduct this excavation, did you, Mr. Walkley? No, I can't, Gary. What I can say, if I can explain, I became aware of this metadata last week and I could not understand why my memory was telling me categorically that I excavated for several hours and I thought I must be going crazy. So I, I made a phone call to Mr Johnson in Launceston. No, can, can no, I, no, Mr Walker. Well, I'll no, go back Mr. then. I, I thought I was going crazy because I thought I'm crazy because I, I was confident that we were digging for two or three hours. Yes, well, Mr and, Walkley... But the, but the metadata's proven me wrong, so I'll mm. accept that I'm wrong. Mr Walkley, that's the problem with memory, isn't it, when you attempt to recount events from um, 
over eight years ago. Absolutely. When you have no notes. Absolutely. Now, the length of the excavation, you gave evidence that you believed it was some two to three metres. That's correct. And your memory about that's wrong as well, isn't it? Oh, I still believe that's around about what it was. Can we have a look at uh, document 24, please? Page 55. And if we see photograph 33, we need to, yes, measurement is approximately 1.6 metres. See that? Caption to, to photo yes. 33. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. yeah. So again, your memory's faulty? No, this only shows a part of our excavation. It doesn't show the entire excavation. That shows a part of it. Um, well, would you like to find a photograph which shows, point the court to a photograph which shows more excavation, please? Photograph 30. There. That shows the excavation beyond, and the, there is no photograph that I've seen that shows the entire area excavated from the start to the finish. There is no photo, unfortunately, to show where we started the excavation. And indeed, while you were excavating, the police photographer was away photographing other areas of the property, wasn't he? I do not remember. Well, we could have a look, please. Um, we'll need document 101. And if we start at photograph 7, if you can accept that the metadata shows that these photographs are taken um, in time, one after the other, and we'll move through them, please. Now, it appears, just slow down for a moment, it appears the photographer has gone uh, down to the um, area to the east of where the excavation is occurring. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that, yes. And if we keep going, please. And that's Mr. Bones. We'll probably get a better picture of him oh, in a moment. I, I do know that's Mr. Bones. You know that's Mr. Bones. So um, if you were excavating during this time, um, which is the period between 1.24 and um, 2.07, Seven. thank you, and 2.07, Mr. Bones was not with you, nor was the police photographer. No, not for the entire time. I've, I've already said that. Keep going, please. Just back, please. Now, can we enlarge that, um, please? To move to the left, go to the two people who are there. Now, are you able to identify um, either person? They're both police officers from their hats that I can see. Right. Is there a picture of you there? Not that I can identify. Right. Picture of Mr Johnson there? Not that I can identify. Right. So you were not excavating at the time that photograph was taken? I have no idea. The photograph doesn't tell me anything. Like, is that somebody, is that blackness on the left of the tree under the pink tape a person? That may be a person. Do you recall um, that, that anyone could, taking that 
stance? Well, we are on our hands and knees when we were digging the root out, so it could have been one of us on our hands and knees. I do not know from that photo. Right. We keep going, please. If you, oh, sorry. Next, next photo, yes, thank you. That's Mr Bones. That is. Yeah. Then we get back to the excavation and it is well underway. It is. Near to complete. I don't know that's near to complete. I said earlier on that that is not the completion of the excavation, it is part way through it. Right. Now, I want to suggest to you that you cease the excavation because you had to get to the helicopter. No, I, I don't agree with that. Sorry, I don't agree with that. Well, you may not have had to have got to the helicopter, but uh, Mr Bones Mr Needham had to get to it. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember a helicopter on flight on that day. Right. We go back to photo 58, please. Um, thank you. And the metadata for that photograph, please. This is 3.20 p.m. Now, does it refresh your memory that you were up in the air by 3.20 p.m.? No, it doesn't. I don't recall at all going for a flight in a helicopter on that day. I do know that I went for a helicopter flight, but I believe it was either the day after or the day after that. And on that occasion, it was just myself and Mr Bones who went on the flight. I see. Thank you. We could have... Um, Photograph 50 up, 58 up, please. Are you able to recognise the vehicle that is shown in that photograph? No, I don't. No, I can't. Did you come in your own vehicle? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I went with Mr Bones. From, mem from memory? Mr Bones' vehicle is not shown in that photograph. I don't know. What, I don't remember what vehicle was driving, but that's the only vehicle I can see anyway. Okay, can we have a look at document 101, photo 9, please? Now, is this the photograph of the charcoal that led you to the excavation? Sorry, but I don't remember. I, I, I don't recall. Sorry, I just don't remember if that was a specific one. Right. Um, well, it's got cone 20 next to it. But As I understand it, cone 20 was placed next to the charcoal that led to your excavation. I didn't place any cones, so I can't comment. All right. Well, now... Um, do you agree that there's a depression shown between um, the rocks and the cone, which is 200 to 400 mil uh, wide and 150 mil deep? I'd be happy to say it was 200 mil wide, but the depth is a bit hard without. It's only two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. I can't really comment. Well, you remember when you found the charcoal, it was in a depression of about 200 to 400 mil wide and 150 mil deep, wasn't it? No, I don't recall that either. Do you recall that you saw a rock that appeared to have rolled into the ash in the area in which you found the charcoal? No, I don't recall that. Sorry. 
it's, it's, this you, all this is possible, but I don't recall it. Do you recall that in the area of the uh, charcoal that you found there were unburnt sticks, grass and leaves? Do you recall that? No, I don't recall that either, sorry. Now, we'll see an object in this photograph. Um, it's close to the to the rock at the top. It's a greyish or blackish looking object. Uh, if you can move the, uh, keep going across to the centre of the photograph, please. Mr. Tempano now straight up. Right, do you see that? If you could just, uh, can we get a little bit closer, Mr. Tempano? Now that appears to be um, a piece of charcoal. It does. Right. Um, is that the piece of charcoal that you saw? I don't recall. As I've said, I don't recall this photograph or that area. Right. It may have well been, but I don't recall seeing it. Um, have a look at the um, document 101, photo 50. If we go across to the right of that photograph, about yes and yes, you've almost got your cursor on it. Just come across a little bit further to the right, a little bit further. You'll see a black object there. Did you see that, Mr. Walkley? Can you help us with what it is? I've no idea what it is. I've if it was there, then I would have seen it because I was working there, but I don't recall seeing it. I don't recall what it was, and I can't tell from the photograph what it is. Can we have a look at photo eight, please? Now, you can see there part of the stump in question. Is that correct? That's correct. Can we enlarge the bottom left-hand corner? Keep going. Keep going. Thank you. And just drop it down a little bit, please. No, other way. Other way. You see there a cigarette butt? Where? Move the, if you could move the uh, cursor onto the cigarette butt. Thank you, Mr. I, I do see that. Yes. And, uh, and if we can go across to the right, please. Keep going. And to more to the bottom. Keep going. And further to the right. Do you see there a rolly, a stub of a rolly? I could see something. I wouldn't confirm that it was a rolly cigarette. Right. You didn't uh, locate either of those despite your careful search, did you? No, I did not. We have a look at document 15, page 291. <laughs> Um, oh, Bates, yes. Yes, now do you see in that photograph um, some plastic? It looks possibly plastic up in the top left-hand corner. Yes. Do you see any glass in that photograph? No, that looks to me like the plastic top of a coffee cup. Right. You didn't find that in your... Searches of the area? No, I don't recall seeing that. No. no. You didn't find any glass in that area? Not that I recall. No. Have a look at page 279 of this document, please. Now you've read Mr Gilmore's report and you've seen what he said about uh, this burnt route um, across close to 
uh, where cone 20 was. Did you see that route with a bird on the end of it? I can't say I did or didn't. Uh, this looks to me to be not the same area. I don't even recognise the area. It's all, all grassy and green. Yeah, it's, it's to the west of where the excavation took place, which was grassy and green, wasn't it? I don't recall if it was this, that, that grassy or that green. I'd, I'd like to have some context to where this photo actually is, rather than just the photo by itself. I can't make out where it is in the whole scheme of things. Right, could we scroll down, please, to the caption? Looking west on the edge of the area of origin at a charred route, which, uh, looking looking west on the edge of the area of origin, that's its that's it, its location. It doesn't say how far west. That's I'm, I'm having trouble orientating in my mind how far this is from our area of origin or how far from the house. I'm just having trouble orientating myself to where it is, specifically. Now, as to your area of origin, the um, pink tape was put up by whom? I don't remember. And what was it put up to um, represent? The area of origin. Could the um, witness please be shown document 118, Bates, Bates 288? <laughs> 288, yes, that's, yeah, are you familiar with, um, with this? Work the guide to wildland fire, wild land fire origin and cause determination. No, I'm not. All right. Can we go to page 327 of it, please? Oh, 327. You'll see there that uh, there's a clump of what I'll call grass. You might have a different descriptor for it, um, and it shows the fire direction. Do you agree uh, that that is correct? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, the witness please be shown document 101, photo 6. <coughs> and if we can enlarge at the bottom there a similar clump of, a clump of grass, do you agree that that shows the fire direction towards cone 20? Yes, I do. Thank you. We have a look at photo 10, please. And you see, uh, if we can enlarge the clump of what appears to be grass, move that to the centre. Thank you. Do you agree that that shows uh, direction of fire travel from south to north? I do. Or, once again, it's not three-dimensional, but it's, it appears I can't see what's on the other side of that grass clump, but it, it appears to be, as you say. Yeah. Now, both of those uh, clumps are were within the area of origin. Yes. And neither of them supported a direction of fire travel from east to west. What's That's correct, isn't it? What they do support is it's an, in, an area of confusion where the fire travels in several directions. Neither of them support direction of fire travel from west to east, do they, Mr Walkley? Subject to what I was saying, they don't because it's an area of confusion. Thank you. Now, um, Mr. Walkley, you <coughs> came in with a folder and some notes. If you'd be kind enough to give me the notes. Thank you. And as to the folder, uh, did you read through that folder for the purpose of giving uh, your evidence? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, if I could be handed that as well. No, I'll give you that. Thank you. Yes, that was for the witness. Um, thank you. The witness has handed me the MRU. I tend to that. Uh, the paper doesn't need to go in. It's on the system. 
it, well, it will be. It will. So I'll tender it. Can Mr. Timponi remedies your omission? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm, I would hope he does. Um, All right. Thank you. You're under that. Ten, the tender's noted, and that's a convenient time. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll adjourn to ten o'clock tomorrow morning, then, Mr. Walfrey. Thank you very much. We'll stand, please. This honourable court now stands adjourned until ten a.m. tomorrow.